Okay, good morning and welcome to the first of the series of seminars that we're going to be doing on phonocardiography. And that's why we call it an introduction. And we did a preliminary introduction at the update in September, for those of you who are here. And uh, we were all thrilled with the results. And many of you have been using the ideas with your patients in the last six weeks. So what I've done is I've put together a day's work for us, which includes workshopping, so that you'll be able to use this on Monday with your patients, uh, to give you the basics of how to examine people from the heart point of view, uh, and also their cardiovascular performance uh, and total body mind-heart relationships. So phonocardiography um, is an idea of phono being sound and cardiography being listening to the, uh, to the heart. So a phonocardiogram, which is what we actually record, is a recording of the sounds and murmurs made by the heart with the help of the digital stethoscope, of the sounds made by the heart during a cardiac cycle. The sounds are a result from vibrations created by the closure of the heart valves. So when we feel a pulse, and you have a pulsation in, in your wrist here, you actually feel that. So everybody's felt their pulse, obviously. But you don't hear the pulse. The pulse is 72 times per minute, and you actually feel it. And people say, oh, yes, I can hear my heart, because when I sleep on the pillow, I can hear this thump, thump, thump. But in fact, they don't actually hear their heart at all. They're hearing, they're feeling their pulse. It's a feeling. You don't hear, because when you hear a heart, and many people have never heard their own heart until to the, till this time when they do the examination, we do the examination, um, you actually get two sounds. You get lub-dub, lub-dub, or you should get lub-dub with a bit of luck. <laughs> okay, so the sounds are a result, as we'll see, from the closure of certain vowels, which hopefully occur synchronously. Uh, there are at least two sounds, and sometimes there's more, but more would be abnormal. The first is when the atrioventricular valves close. That's between the atriums, as we see, and the ventricles close. At the beginning of what is called systole, which is when the heart muscle contracts and sends that pulse out, which is what we read on the blood pressure and you feel on your pulsation. And the second is when the aortic and the pulmonary valves close, um, which is when to try and stop the blood from flowing back in the pulmonary artery and the aorta back into the ventricles. It allows the detection of subaudible sounds and murmurs and makes a permanent record of these events. So when you develop the ideas here and you get the program to go with this, then you'll be able to do the recordings and you'll be able to do the, see the recordings. <coughs> but you can do everything that we're going to do today, you can do simply with a stethoscope. And we're going to, from a practical point of view, give each table, and I think it's, how many have we got, Bob? We've got enough for every three people, I think. Every two or three people. So you'll all be able to do this as far as workshopping. And you can do this with a five-pound stethoscope, all right? The only thing is you won't have the details of exactly what it is that's wrong, but you will know that there's something wrong, okay? And that's the cleverness of what all this is about. Now, the original phonocardiograph, or endocardiograph, was developed by Dr. Royal Lee uh, back in 1937. And he was the founder of Standard Process Nutrition Company. And as you can see, this was high tech in 1937. Okay? So you can imagine like the computers that you see pictures of in the 1960s at IBM. And then it's whittled down to one little machine about that size. So the endocardiograph was the first one. And it ran on waxed paper with a needle which scratched into the waxed paper. So you can imagine, you know, this is real uh, historical stuff. And uh, when, really in the late 1960s, this had been superseded um, and largely died out from being used. But I came across this in, when I was studying for my diplomat exam, um, we had to learn a lot about hypoadrenia. And it's mentioned in Dr. Goodhart's books, writings, and Dr. Schmidt, Wally Schmidt's books, about the funny second sound in hypoadrenia which we had to learn to write in for our exams. But we'd never seen a cardiograph, so we never knew what it actually really meant. And nobody was using it at that particular time. But Dr. Goodhart and uh, Dr. Schmidt re-sort of invented the machine in the 1980s, and this was called an acoustic cardiograph. So you can see this is a little bit like the size of a fan heater. Um, and that was what technology was like, if you remember, only 30 years ago. And we thought these were fantastic, you know, modern machines did everything. But you can begin to see now, again, there's limitations. There's a roll of paper here, rather like we used to have a fax machine, you know, with the rolls of paper that you had to buy, all this sort of stuff. 
Um, and it was, um, it was a good machine, but it didn't seem to really take off. There are a few people on websites who still use this. Um, but I was interested really with the whole idea, um, primarily from people in sports, that was my interest, of why somebody can perform, say an athlete on a track, can perform fantastically well one week. And then the next week they lose all the races. And then they come back on form. And we hear this all the time, don't we, with the, with the cricketers down under at the moment. And athletes, you know, they're, they're on top form and then they're not. And what is the difference between, you know, an athlete being on top form uh, and not? And how do we measure this, you see? And we're used to uh, looking in journals and things and seeing, oh, you need to take more of this. You need to take more of this multiple, more uh, carnitine, more taurine, and all these protein, high protein drinks and all this sort of thing. And I thought, well, surely they're not deficient in protein that much. Surely they're not deficient in a whole load of nutrients. Not if you run 100 meters or 400 meters. Maybe if you run a, a marathon, you can be deficient. You sweated a lot of minerals and things out. But generally speaking, what a person needs to be able to run 100 meters or 400 meters is the same as what they need when they lie on the table. Okay? They don't need anything really much more. They're not going to burn themselves out by running 400 meters. But what is the difference with that performance? And something very surprisingly came up, um, which I realized we were all on the wrong track with looking after athletes and sports people, is it's not the muscles that give up. You know, when the person can't run any further when they hit the wall or they tail off in their performance, in their speed, it's the heart. The heart can't pump anymore, and it simply can't pump the nutrients and the oxygen to the tissues. And this includes the brain. So what we became interested in is setting up something where we could cord the heart using the phonocardiograph into looking at people who were sports people. And I thought, really good, this is going to get really into it. And lo and behold, everybody we tested had problems with their heart, and athletes particularly. <laughs> and that surprised me, because really these people, most of them shouldn't be running in the first place, we thought. And then we discovered that a perfect endocardiograph is as rare as a good set of teeth. Okay, in other words, an enclosure. So many of this work was done and developed in the 1960s and 70s and text written by dentists because they were interested in nutrition in the mouth, etc. And uh, they found that dentists would write that they never see a good occlusion. They never see a perfect set of teeth. You, we see it in textbooks, don't we? Those smiling teeth, everything including exactly opposite as it should be. But a dentist never really sees that. And luckily, the same thing we find with the phonocardiograph. So we don't despair. Now we see a bleep here or a double beat here and so on. We think, well, that's normal for that person, but let's see what they think about it. How does their body reaction or their brain react to it? So I came to the conclusion that we could update this into 2010, 2013. But how would we do it? Surely somebody by now has invented a digital stethoscope with a program that you can record the sounds into a computer. And lo and behold, there are several companies who do the software for this and the, and the digital stethoscopes. And you can not only put it into a laptop, but you can put it into an iPad and an iPhone. Okay, so you can record direct into there the actual heart sounds. And this is fantastic because if you're a cardiologist and you understand all these, what they all mean, it's great, you can come up with a fantastic diagnosis. Uh, but then what do you do about it? And this is the other aspect of this. If a certain cardiac uh, abnormality is related to hypoadrenia, I wonder, is there an abnormality for hyperadrenia? And what about all the other hormones? And as we began to fit the package together, you'll see that all the hormones in the body have an effect on the heart and influence the heart sounds. All the nutrients that the body needs affect the heart, and all the toxins affect the heart. So we've actually got a bigger, much broader scope than what we first thought about with just looking at athletes. Okay, we're actually looking at a whole diagnostic entry into people's health. So here now in 2013, this is the sole bit of equipment you need, and that's a stethoscope. And ideally, you need an electronic one, but you can use an ordinary one. The only thing is you're not gonna get the tracings and of course the tracings now are digital on the computer with the program, which are beautifully done for us. We don't have to have rolls of paper or wax or a needle, okay, which is fantastic. So this can be done by anybody. You don't have to be qualified in any way to do this, but you do need to be qualified to some extent to be able to know what it is that you're recording. Okay, so your diagnostic work, you do need to do a training. 
And what I realised when I was putting this together is to become reasonably qualified and competent in this, you need to do this as an introduction to the basic sounds, what you would do, what you prescribe for your patients, and then to answer some questions in three or four months' time and look at the more clinical applications of that, and especially the broader applications with the circulatory system, and the relationship between the heart and the mind or the head, which is what we develop in the second of the, of the program. And then probably on the third one is we'll look in its relationship to human performance, especially in relationship to sports. So those would be the three. And, you know, it's more like a course, so we're going to call this one an introduction course. So it gives you the fundamentals, so you can go away on Monday and work with this. And I think those of you who started to do this after the update uh, have been amazed at the results and, and the effect on patients and how pleased patients are because they can actually see something from a scientific point of view which you can alter by your introduction of your right nutrients and your detoxification. So this whole system, if you like, is putting science into it with the art, as we'll see, of our muscle testing our, and our biochemical knowledge. Okay, so something that we introduced on the update, um, and this is really, I think, had a big influence probably on getting so many people to come here, which is lovely, is that 80% of all physicians die of heart disease. Now, when you think about that, um, that's rather serious, isn't it? Because physicians, by that, we mean not only medical doctors, but most healthcare practitioners were crowned in the larger scale of physicians. So 80% of physicians die of heart disease. So it's rather important, really, isn't it, that physicians understand a little bit about the heart. 80% of cardiac conditions are in the valves. So this, again, is important when we come to it, because when valves cause problems, they stenose or they regurgitate. In other words, they don't open properly or they don't close properly. And so they create murmurs or sounds. And that's what we can pick up. 6% uh, are nervous, that means the neurological impulse coming from the SA and the AV nodes going down and making the ventricles contract uh, simultaneously. All right? So we can pick all these problems out. So 8% uh, are of neurological origin, and this origin when we come to it is particularly where our toxins fit in. You know, I was quite astounded here how many missed beats, extrasysteles, atrial fibrillations, and so on, you can pick up, but in fact are caused by chemical toxins or particularly toxic metals. So you'll see all of this. And 4%, and only 4% of heart conditions, are coronary. But they're the big ones. They're the ones that get the name because they may be life-threatening, or you may not have a second chance. And even if you learn nothing else today, but you learn how to predict a coronary, okay, this is invaluable for yourself. Okay? Your patients come after that, but if you can predict a coronary in yourself and do something about it, because nobody else can really do this. You know, we've heard probably all cases where our patients or have told stories, they've had thorough private medical investigations, taking a whole morning and costing a lot of money, and the person's got a clean bill of health and drops dead the next day from a heart attack. And you think, why was that? You know, surely somebody must have seen something happening in there. And the beauty of the phonocardiograph is you can hear it and see it, uh, where the electrocardiograph you can't until after the event. So the electrocardiograph will show you uh, the damage to the heart tissue after the event. But that's a bit late for you then, isn't it? Because you may not have that, that chance. Okay. So more people are affected and die with heart disease than any other illness. That's still probably true. Although the papers now seem to indicate that um, respiratory problems are gaining a lot, which is surprising because you think about the air being cleaner. Um, <laughs> but respiratory problems are big issues now, and of course cancer. So they're all vying there for the number one position. Uh, but this time, you know, when we looked at the cancer in the previous module in March, we sort of concentrated more on that blue body type. Do you remember? Because it was the blue ones who tend to get out. Today we'll be looking much more at the reds possibly with the influence of the greens as well, but it's the reds who are the ones who are prone to the cardiovascular disease. So you'll see how the red profile really fits into today's work, but it's not solely the red. It doesn't mean that greens don't get heart attacks or heart problems or blues. You know, you're not immune, but on the other hand, we know that a lot of our patients are of that disposition. And we'll see that we'll find that 100% of red people have got the predisposition 
to heart disease and because they all have the defect, the genetic defect, which allows them to build up homocysteine. Okay? And also have the APOE4 expression of the apolipoprotein so they don't carry cholesterol fragments and toxic metals away. All right? So 100%. So all the people who are read in this realm should take special attention here and watch the DVD two or three times until they really understand um, about themselves and their patients. Right, heart and circulatory disease, okay, um, which also includes diseases caused by high blood pressure. Now, high blood pressure is a result of a problem. It's not a problem. But the standard sort of treatment for high blood pressure is to give a medication which stops it from going so high. Either it makes you pass more water out, it relaxes the blood vessels, it stimulates the angiotensin and so on. So they're all sort of ways of handling it, but not dealing with the issue of why you've got the blood pressure in the first place. And we'll see how we can detect the blood pressure out from the cardiograph. It's responsible for 231 deaths per 100,000 in men across the UK, but 267 out of 100,000 in Scotland. Okay? So it's good that the Scots want independence because they can look after and pay the budget for their greater incidence of heart disease when the time comes. Okay, now in Britain, and this was quite surprising, that includes Scotland and Northern Ireland, okay. Uh, one million men have suffered heart attacks. That's a lot, isn't it, when you think about it. One million men. And they're not all old. <laughs> uh, and they're talking now about people in their 30s and 40s. But you don't hear so much because a lot of people have heart attacks and don't really know they've even had one. Okay, they've got occlusion in there. Um, but one million. And 500,000 women have suffered heart attacks. So half the amount um, have, uh, have heart attacks as well. And I believe the indication is that postmenopausally, the numbers are much more equal. Okay? Premenopausal, it's much more men, and women are protected somewhat by the estrogens within their, their hormonal system. But postmenopausally, Although you continue, the women continue to, to produce estrogens, there are different types of estrogens. There's less of the E2, the estradiol, but the predominant one is E1 or estrone, which offers less protection than the estriol or possibly the uh, estradiol or possibly the estriol, the E3. Uh, but nobody's really looked into that. Um, but heart attack victims should opt for a Mediterranean diet, this Press One reports. Um, it's very much against the fish, and we'll talk about why fish oil is perhaps not a good idea with cardiovascular problems. And most of you know, have been aware that I've been saying this for the last couple of years uh, because of the mercury content, and we'll see that mercury really does block the production of energy in the body because it blocks pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme between metabolizing pyruvate into the Krebs cycle. And if you don't get that energy, then you're not only does your muscles not work and your brain doesn't work, but your heart doesn't work either. In other words, you can't contract to pump the very blood out. So um, what they're saying here is go to eat fish, but not the concentrated fish oil. Have, you know, maybe a portion of oily fish here. But the most important thing is to go to the land-based omega-3 oils. In other words, uh, non-marine sourced oils are much more, and that's what they're proposing there, and we'll be talking about that during the day as to why. And also the balance, the ratios of the omega-3 to the omega-6. This is really important in heart disease to make sure we got that right. So, in applied kinesiology, and all forms of kinesiology, we know there's a relationship between the spine and the organs, and between the spine and the muscles. And this has been known and taught for um, probably 40 years or 50 years now since uh, uh, Dr. Goodhart introduced us in the 1960s to these concepts. And some organs have several muscles which have the same nerve supply that operates the blood to the organ. All right? This is not the nerve supply to the organ itself, this vertebral level, it's the vertebral level of the nerve that operates the blood to the organ. Okay, so in other words, it's the sympathetic nervous system chain. So in this case, what Dr. Goodhart found is the subscapularis muscle is associated with the heart. And I'm sure all those who do kinesiology know that only too well. 
but it's not the nerve supply to the heart. Okay? It's the sympathetic nerve which regulates the blood vessels. Okay? So the nerve that supplies the subscapularis muscle, we'll see, is a brachial plexus nerve in the lower cervicals. But the nerve supply to the heart is sympathetic and parasympathetic. Okay? So when we talk about the vertebral level and the ratio, the relationship of the muscle organ relationship, it's the viscerosomatic part, in other words, it's the nerve which operates the blood supply. So let's just make sure we remember that. And what Dr. Goodhart found in all his research, his length of time in clinical research, is there was consistently only one muscle associated with the heart. Okay? Rather like we have the popliteus with the gallbladder, and nobody's really discovered another one. I'm sure there probably are subtle divisions of the, like the work of Adam Biddle, which will pick up other organ relationships. But for us, it makes it easier that there's only one muscle. Okay? And we also know that this subscapularis muscle is on both arms. So that makes it handy. So we've only got two muscles to compare and to test. And it's interesting that it's on both sides. And therefore, it's nerve supply um, and any sensory input goes to the brain and crosses over. All right? So we're probably all aware that when you deal with the right side of the body, it goes to the left brain and vice versa. Now the subscapular, subscapularis muscle uh, starts off, its origin is in the fossa of the scapula, and as we can see it runs to the lesser tuberosity of the humerus and the fibrous capsule, and that makes it a rotator cuff muscle. Okay? So this is a muscle which is frequently damaged with rotator cuff injuries. So in this case, you may not always want to use the subscapularis on the bad side of the patient if they've got a rotator cuff muscle. Okay? Because the rotator cuff means that the tendon of insertion passes through the fibrous capsule and strengthens it, acting in the same way as an extra ligament. Okay? So if you've got a rotator cuff injury, you are likely to dislocate the shoulder as the practitioner, and that doesn't go down well with the patient. Uh, especially if you never had that occur to you before and you're not quite familiar how to put it back. <laughs> okay? So in other words, you don't want to pop the glenohumeral joint out in the process of doing a muscle test. So, but you can simply use the opposite one, and I'll show you how you do this, if necessary. Okay? So if it causes pain or there's a laxity in the muscle and you haven't been able to strengthen that muscle, then we'll use the other one. All right? Now, something really interesting about this muscle is that it's uh, triangular in shape. Okay? And it's clearly divided, as you can see in this picture, into four parts. So we've got a subscapularis, a horizontal part. So this is the one which rotates our arm inwards. So it pushes the hand in towards your tummy. So this is the standard sort of muscle test for subscapularis of the horizontal division. Okay? I can always remember that and because the teres minor muscle pushes out from that position and is horizontal, runs horizontally, and the subscapularis does this. Okay? Now, the lower part is oblique. And we're going to call that on here subscapularis oblique head three. So this part runs in this direction. Okay? And this one is the more traditional stronger part, which is tested in this way. So the standard AK textbooks, David Walther's books, etc., and Dr. Goodhart, put it in this position. So the arm is abducted to 90 degrees, elbow to 90 degrees, and the arm is rotated in and the patient pushes down with the hand towards the floor or behind them. Okay, and that's the way we test. And that particular test will be more the lower part or the oblique part. Okay? Now, the subscapularis has divisions in between because sometimes we have the arm here, uh, and in order to do that and that, we have to go in between. So there are divisions, if you like, those two middle ones. So you've got that one, that one, if you like, and that one, and then finally that one. Okay? So sometimes you may need to test it in different positions. But generally, as you'll see with cardiac relationships, it's the oblique division which seems to be the main one that's affected. Okay? Now that may be, because we've got four parts to the muscle, there could be a significance, could be in the relationship to the different chambers in the heart or the valves. We don't know that for sure at this particular time. So if a right subscapulous muscle weakens, it doesn't mean it's the right side of the heart. Okay? 
it could mean that the heart is involved and the same with the left. It's not as easy as saying left and right, but you will begin to understand why that is. Now, subscapularis is the muscle related to the arm wrestle. Okay, so all of those who are keen on arm, rest arm wrestling, choose somebody who's got a cardiac problem. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, most people, as we'll see, are weak on the left with the, in relationship to the cardiac, but not always, and there's a very good reason for this as well. So you may win this way, may lose this way, but you'll win this way. Okay. So remember, it is the one involved with the rotation. But we do this quite a lot because when we go to our back pocket and get out our money or keys or that, this is the muscle that does it. So it's the subscapularis, which is the main medial rotator of the arm. Okay, so remember its function is medial rotation. So nerve supply is the subscapular nerve, which is C5 and 6, so it's lower cervical. So if the muscle is weak in the clear, you need to try and find out through your normal five factors of the IVF and muscle testing how to strengthen that up. Okay? We don't go in because the muscle's weak to say, ah, oh, you've got a heart problem. Okay? In fact, we've learned not to say that at all anyway. Don't tell the patient when you do the cardiograph, you've got a heart problem. Let's say, we'll have a look at what you, you think of this, what your brain thinks of this, your nervous system. Um, well, because people do worry about it, and that's, that's not good either. Okay, and um, we know that the meridian associated, in other words, the flow of electromagnetic energy is related to the heart meridian. So the aortic um, pulmonary area, tricuspid area, and mitral area are the areas on the surface of the chest where the heart is auscultated. That means where we listen to it, okay? So what we're listening to is the areas where the valves are, okay? So that's what we're, we're listening to. So when we listen to a heart, we listen to the valves. When we feel a pulse, we feel the pulsation, right? There's a subtle difference there. Heart sounds result from the reverberation within the blood associated with the sudden block of flow uh, of the reversal of the valves closing. So as the valves close, we get the sound, okay? So the two uh, between the chambers will close, hopefully, simultaneously, and the two in the arteries will close simultaneously, which gives us our two sounds of our our lub and our dub. Because of, this auscultation, because of this auscultation to determine the function of valve is usually not performed at the position of the valve but at the, sound, at the place where the sound waves reverberate. Okay? So in other words, where we're going to listen with the stethoscope is not the precise area over the valve but where you hear the sound best. Okay? So this is the actual position of the valves so we have mitral, tricuspid, aortic, and pulmonary. But this is the position where we hear them. Okay? So we're going to hear them a little bit further out because of the reverberation of the sounds. Okay? So we're going to be looking there, again, mitral, tricuspid, aortic, and pulmonary. So the points to listen to, the pulmonary is on the second left um, interspace up here, intercostals here. The aorta is on the other side here, on the right. Okay, so that's nice and easy there, there. The mitral, which is on the back, is the left fifth interspace. Um, so basically, just, just underneath the nipple. The, the nipple in the male is really the fifth interspace, so it's just underneath there. In the female, you may need to lift the breast up a little bit to get a good listening in there. And, there. and the tricuspid is just on the left side, again, horizontal to that, but slightly left of the midline. Okay? So mitral, tricuspid, um, aortic, and pyre. Now, there's one other point, and this is the most valuable point I find, called Herb's point, and this is in the left third intercostal space, so it's a little bit between those two. So if I go back on there, we call that E. And Herb's point is one of the best points for listening to the heart of the general overall sounds, right? Because obviously if we're going to listen over the mitral area, we're going to hear mainly the mitral valve. But we're not really going to hear what's going to happen with the other valves. And similarly, with, if we listen to the aorta or the pulmonary, we're only really going to concentrate on those. So the sort of central point, if you like, where you can hear all sounds to be able to pick it up, particularly the second sound, which is so important, which is the closing of the aorta and the pulmonaries, we listen at Herb's point. So we would suggest at this stage, when you're starting your work with patients, um, get to Herb's, go to Herb's point, okay, rather than listening at different valves and things. It's much easier to get one central point, master that, 
And then later on, particularly in the second module, when you've had three or four months' experience with patients, we can then look at the pulmonary valve in a little bit more and the mitral valve, etc. So we'll be doing most of our work today off the E point or herbs point. Okay, in cardiology, herbs point refers to the third intercostal space uh, where S2, or the second sound as we'll call it, is best heard. It is essentially the same uh, point as the lower left, lower sternal border. Okay. So what we know our blood does is the blood pumps from the left ventricle. The left ventricle, as we see, is where the real work occurs in the heart. The muscle is much thicker there than anywhere else in the heart because that left ventricle has to pump really hard to squeeze the blood out of the ventricle into the aorta and then that has to go to all the arteries in the body. And the amazing thing is that it goes up to your head, whizzes around your head, and it goes down to your big toe, and in all those little bits and pieces in between, all those capillaries there. And by the time it's got to your big toe, um, those of you who did the update will know this, how long it takes to get from here to the end of your big toe is 16 seconds. Okay? And 16 seconds to come back again. Okay? That's pretty fast, isn't it? So when something gets into your blood, it's going round the circulation extraordinarily fast. Now that may slow down to several minutes if it's in deep tissue with a lot of capillaries. Okay, but with the main blood vessels, the blood will get down to the distal end in 16 seconds. That's fast, okay? So we'll see that when there's a problem with the heart, you can measure it on the big toe or, or vice versa. If there's a problem with the circulation not getting to the end of your feet, it really means the heart isn't contracting enough. And this is one of the most common things we'll find is the vast majority of people who have problems, simply their muscles aren't contracting. Okay. And this is really extraordinary because the heart is a living entity on its own. Okay. We can cut a heart out, okay. and you can put that person on a life support machine, and they'll continue to live there, and their heart will be over here in a nice medium of the right salts, right pH balance things, and carrying on beating. And experiments years ago with chicken hearts showed that a chicken heart will beat on its own for 24 years before some person put the wrong pH medium into there and the heart died. Okay? But that chicken heart outpaced the chicken <laughs> by at least five or tenfold its life. So in other words, the heart is a living entity. Okay? Now the fascinating thing is that the heart starts beating in the human being uh, after, bef after the circulation has been formed. And studies in animals, they haven't done this in humans yet, but studies in animals indicate that the blood circulates before the heart starts beating. So the question now is, how important is the heart to the circulation of the blood? Does the heart respond to help push the blood and act as an extra beater, or does the blood circulation have an inherent rhythm to itself, which is now found to be electromagnetic with the charges on the red blood cells? So you notice the circulation is almost like a living entity on its own as well, far more important than what we ever thought of. So the heart pumps from the left ventricle to the tissues, in other words, to the big toe, to the organs, to the muscles, and that blood comes back then by the superior and inferior vena cava, or veins, to the right atrium in the, in the, in the heart. Okay? And from there, the blood goes from the right atrium to the left atrium, which contracts on systole again, and pumps it into the aortic artery, uh, the pulmonary artery, sorry, um, which takes the blood, the deoxygenated blood, to the lungs, where it's reoxygenated, and comes back then with the pulmonary vein to the left, vent left atrium. It then passes through into the left ventricle and is pumped round again. Okay, so that's the circulation story. So basically what comes back to the heart is venous blood, which is run out or lowered in its tension of oxygen, and arterial blood is, uh, is, is charged up with the oxygen from the lungs. So there we see the heart there, and the blue are the veins and the red are the arteries. So a quick little bit of the anatomy here um, is that the four chambers, the left ventricle is the one which does all the real work here, the right ventricle is what pumps it into the lungs, and then we've got the right atrium and the left atrium, then we've got the pulmonary artery uh, trunk there and the aorta. And we'll know that there's certain arteries come off the aorta fairly early on and send blood up to the head. Mainly these are, the, of course, the carotids and things. 
but there's a little very, very important couple of branches off right at the beginning, and these are called the coronary vessels. Okay? We hear a lot about those because they're rather important for the circulation of the heart itself. So the coronary arteries actually sit on the surface of the heart. Uh, and then they penetrate into the myocardium, into the muscle tissue itself. But they actually sit, fit, uh, sit on the surface of that. And they're basically divided into left and right, and the left one has the descending branch, and the right one is the coronary here. So we'll come back to looking at the circulation of the heart itself, um, because this is the most important muscle in the body. It does more work. If you think about it, it probably starts beating very, very early on in, uh, in the fetus. And it goes on till you make your last breath, virtually. Give or take you know, a few moments either side. And it doesn't stop. And it goes at a rate of just under a second. When we think about it, you know, you're getting a pulse of 70, 72 pulses, uh, beats per minute. And the 60 seconds in a minute. So it's about 0.85 of a second. It's the whole cycle all over. And so we've contracted, we've relaxed in that period and done lots of all sorts of things in there. And most importantly, we fed the coronary vessels to feed the heart itself. But because the heart doesn't stop beating, because it has this inherent rhythm on its own, plus we can increase it with the sympathetics and decrease it with the parasympathetics, it beats an awful lot and it uses more energy than anywhere else in the body. So therefore those muscles have to have a lot of mitochondria to supply the energy, the ATP. So there are many hundreds of um, mitochondria in the atrial muscle, in the, in, the, in the heart muscles. That means that if we begin to get tired and we're not producing the right amount of ATP, the heart, of course, is one of the first places you're going to see it. And the incredible thing is the heart is also one of the most important places where we see anything. Okay? Everything seems to show up in there. Toxins, infections, deficiencies, allergies. It all shows up in there if you know how to read the cardiograph. Hormone imbalances, everything is in there. 